So I'm going to um, start the reading. Um, I hope that you're all well and that you are keeping safe during this time. Here is a moment for you of reprieve. This one is called A Disciple. The Hungarians arrived among us, not in a trickle, but all at once. In the space of two months, May and June 1944, they invaded the camp, convoy after convoy, filling the void, which the Germans had not neglected to create, with a series of diligent selections. The newcomers caused a profound change in the fabric of all the camps. At Auschwitz, the wave of Magyars reduced the other nationalities to minorities without, however, making a dent in the cadres, which remained in the hands of the German and Polish common criminals. All the barracks and work squads were inundated by the Hungarians, around whom, as happens in all communities around new arrivals, an atmosphere of derision, gossip, and vague intolerance rapidly condensed. They were workmen and peasants, simple and robust, who did not fear manual labor, but were used to abundant food, and who for that reason, in a few weeks, were reduced to pitiful skeletons. Others were professional men, students and intellectuals, who came from Budapest or other cities. They were mild individuals, slow, patient and methodical, and hunger afflicted them less. But they had delicate skins and in no time at all were covered with sores and bruises like ill-treated horses. At the end of June, a good half of my squad was made up of fine fellows, still well nourished, still full of optimism and joviality. They communicated with us in a curious dragged out German and communicated with each other in their odd language, which bristles with unusual inflections and seems to be made up of interminable words pronounced with irritating slowness and all with the accent on the first syllable. One of them was assigned to me as a work companion. He was a strong, pink-faced young man of medium height, whom everyone called Bundy, the diminutive of Andre, Andre, he explained to me as though it were the most natural thing in the world. Our task that day was to carry bricks on a sort of crude wooden litter, equipped with two poles in front and two behind, 20 bricks per trip. Halfway along the path stood an overseer and he checked to see that the load was regulation. 20 bricks are heavy. So on the outgoing trip, we did not have much breath, or at least I didn't, for talking. But on the way back, we spoke and I learned many attractive things about Bandy. I wouldn't be able to repeat them all today, every memory fades, and yet I cling to the memory of this man Bandy as precious things, and I am happy to preserve them on a page. I only wish that by some not impossible miracle, the page might reach him in the corner of the world where he still lives perhaps that he might read it and recognize himself in it. He told me his name was Ed Endre Sancho, a name which is pronounced more or less like Santo in Italian. And this reinforced in me the vague impression that a halo seemed to encircle his shaved head. I told him so, but no, he explained laughingly to me. Janto means plowman or more generically, Peasant. It is a very common last name in Hungary. And besides, he was not a plowman, but worked in a factory. The Germans had captured him three years earlier, not because he was Jewish, but because of his political activity, had enrolled him in the Tot organization and sent him to be a woodcutter in the Ukrainian Carpathians. 
he had spent two winters in the woods, cutting down pine trees with three companions. Heavy work, but he had liked it and had been almost happy there. Besides, I soon realized that Bandy had a unique talent for happiness. Oppression, humiliation, hard work, exile, all seemed to slide off him like water off a rock without corrupting or wounding him, indeed purifying and enhancing in him his inborn capacity for joy. As we are told happened to the simple, cheerful and pious Hasidim, described by Jiri Langa in his novel, The Nine Doors. Bandy told me about his entrance into the camp. When the convoy arrived, the SS forced all the men to take off their shoes, hang them around their necks, and then made them walk barefoot on the jagged stones of the railroad bed for the entire seven kilometers that separated the station from the camp. He recounted the episode with a shy smile without asking for commiseration. On the contrary, with a touch of childlike and athletic vanity that he had brought it off. We made three trips together, during which I tried in a fragmentary fashion to explain to him that the place he had landed in was not for polite or quiet people. I tried to convince him of a few recent discoveries of mine, in truth, not well digested yet, that down there, in order to get by, it was necessary to get busy organize illegal food, dodge work, find influential friends, hide one's thoughts, steal and lie. That whoever did not do so was soon dead and that his saintliness seemed dangerous to me and out of place. And since, as I have said, 20 bricks are heavy, on our fourth trip, instead of taking 20 of them off the wagon, I took 17 and showed him that if you place them on the litter in a certain way with an empty space in the lower layer, no one would ever suspect that there weren't 20. This was a ruse I thought I had invented. I found out later that it was, however, in the public domain. And that I had used several times with success. At other times, it had earned me some nasty blows. In any case, it seemed to me that for pedagogical purposes, it served well as an illustration of the theories I had expounded to him just before. Bandy was very sensitive about his condition of Tsugang, that is, new arrival, and to the condition of social subjection that derived from it. Therefore, he did not object but neither did he show any enthusiasm for my invention. If there are 17, why should we make them believe that there are 20? But 20 bricks weigh more than 17, I answered impatiently. And if they are well arranged, no one will notice. Besides, they're not going to be used to build your house or mine. Yes, he said, but... There's still 17 bricks, not 20. He was not a good disciple. We worked together for a few more weeks in the same squad. He told me that he was a communist sympathizer, not a party member. But his language was that of a proto-Christian. At work, he was dexterous and strong, the best worker in the squad. But he did not try to profit from the superiority of his, or show off to the German foreman, or lord it over us. I told him that in my opinion, working like this was a waste of energy, and that it was also politically wrong. But Bandy gave no sign of understanding me. He did not want to lie. In that place, we were supposed to work so he worked as best he could. In no time, with his radiant and childlike face, 
his energetic voice, his awkward gait, Bandy became very popular, everyone's friend. August came. With it, an extraordinary gift for me, a letter from home, an unprecedented event. In June, with frightful irresponsibility and through the mediation of a free Italian laborer who was a bricklayer, I had written a message for my mother who was hidden in Italy and addressed it to a woman friend of mine named Bianca Guidetta Serra. I had done all this as one observes a ritual without really hoping for success. Instead, my letter had arrived without difficulty and my mother had answered via the same route. The letter from the sweet world burned in my pocket and I knew it was elementary prudence to keep silent and yet I had to talk about it. At that time, we were cleaning cisterns. I went down into my cistern and Bandy was with me. By the weak gleam of the light bulb, I read the miraculous letter, hastily translating it into German. Bandy listened attentively. Certainly, he could not understand much because German was neither my language nor his, and also because the message was scant and reticent. But he understood what was essential for him to understand that that piece of paper in my hands, which had reached me in such a precarious way and which I would destroy before nightfall, represented a breach, a small gap in the black universe that closed tightly around us. And through that breach, hope could pass. At least I believe that Bandy, even though he was a Tsukan, understood or sensed this, because when I was through reading, he came close to me, rummaged at length in his pocket, and finally, with loving care, pulled out a radish. He gave it to me, blushing deeply, and said with shy pride, I've learned this is for you. It is the first thing I've stolen. Thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow at the same time, same place for another reading from Moments of Reprieve. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. And if anyone, by the way, has any questions that they want to ask or comments to make, we'll keep uh, the video open for a little while, I think, in case anyone wants to make comment. Thank you.